A new analysis from Consumer Reports has got a disturbing headline that protein shakes and powders contain high levels of lead. And given the exploding popularity of protein powders, this has been getting a lot of attention. And the claim, if true, is something that we definitely want to pay attention to. But the Consumer Reports analysis has been provoking some strong pushback. So let's take a look at the argument and see whether it's time to reconsider using protein powders. So Consumer Reports analysed 23 best-selling protein powders and ready-to-drink shakes. So they included dairy, beef and plant-based products. They purchased multiple samples of each product and they also made sure to draw from different lots over a three-month period. And then they transferred the products into identical jars and shipped them to an independent lab for analysis. Each product was tested for protein content, plus arsenic, cadmium and lead. So what did they find? Well, first the good news. All of the products met or exceeded the amount of protein claimed on the label. But then there's the bad news, which has been generating all of the headlines. So they claim to have uncovered a disturbing amount of lead in the protein products that they looked at. So about 70% of the products that they tested had over 120% of the threshold that Consumer Reports used to signal unsafe levels of lead. There was even one product that clocked in at over 1,500% of Consumer Reports' daily lead limit. And the report authors note that these results are even worse than what they saw when they tested the protein powders for the first time back in 2010. So given their findings, it's no surprise where they end up landing in terms of their recommendations to consumers. So they advise against daily use of most protein powders, and in the worst cases, they recommend avoiding them altogether. Now, when faced with a report like this from a respected consumer watchdog, people are rightly concerned. But should we follow this advice and stay away from protein powders? And are they really that dangerous? Well, to answer these questions, we need to add some critical context. First, lead is in virtually all of the foods that we eat today. So at what level does it start to become toxic? Well, the most important risks are connected to the brain. So these are heightened at times of brain development, like in infancy and childhood. So lead exposure at these times can lead to learning disabilities and a lower IQ. And with adults, lead can also affect the brain. We also see problems with kidney function and elevated blood pressure. So when we're exposed to lead, it takes about 30 days for half of it to be removed from our blood. But unfortunately, many of this gets absorbed into the tissues, including the bones and brain. And in these tissues, lead can be present for years, driving negative health impacts. So the concern is that even a small amount of lead consumed in a daily protein powder might add up to a significant exposure over a lifetime. And there's the natural question to ask here, why in the world is lead in protein powder in the first place? Well, a key reason here is that lead is often found in soils and water. So though this is partly natural, much of that lead is from contamination. So lead was once used in gasoline, for example, and it's still used in many industrial and manufacturing processes. So once it's in the soil or water, it gets absorbed into the crops, and it also finds a way into the tissues of animals that feed on those crops. In Consumer Reports analysis, the plant-based protein powders tended to have more lead present, but animal-based products were also found to contain lead as well. So that's why the lead is there, but how should we think about that in terms of the levels present? Are the amounts that Consumer Reports found concerning, or are they being overly cautious? Well, Consumer Reports use the level of 0.5 micrograms per day as their threshold for when we should start to have some concerns, and they base their hypothetical lead exposures for each product based on the serving size. But this 0.5 microgram per day threshold has been generating a lot of pushback, and this is a crucial matter because if the threshold isn't right, then they could be needlessly causing alarm about the products that are actually safe. So why is there pushback? Well, Consumer Reports gets that level from California's Prop 65. So this was a piece of legislation enacted in 1986 to regulate the use of chemicals that could end up in groundwater. But critics have suggested that this legislation it takes an overly cautious approach. So here's how the thresholds for chemicals like lead were set in Prop 65. So it works a bit differently depending on whether it's cancer risk or reproductive harm that's in view. So with cancer, a safe level was set at an exposure that wouldn't cause more than one X case of cancer in 100,000 people over a 70-year period. For reproductive harm, there's a two-step process. First, they determined a level of exposure that has been shown not to cause harm in humans or lab animals. They then divide that by 1,000. So the safe level is set very conservatively. It's with this approach in the background that they arrived at the threshold of 0.5 micrograms per day for lead. 
But other scientific bodies have drawn the line in a very different place. So the Food and Drug Administration in the US, for instance, they set their level at 2.2 micrograms per day for children and 8.8 micrograms per day for women of childbearing age. So that's over 17 times the threshold used by consumer reports when they quoted the Prop 65 numbers. So how did the FDA come up with that number? Well, they start with the level of lead in the blood that's higher than 97.5% of US children. So that level is 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. They then calculate how much lead in the food it would take to reach that level in the blood. And then finally, they set the safety level at one-tenth of that amount. So the FDA's threshold of 0.8 micrograms per day is set far below the level where we have demonstrated health impacts. And it's important to emphasize this because as we've seen, the Consumer Reports level uses an even more conservative number that's 17 times lower than the FDA's already conservative level. And one other piece of information that's really important for context here is the amount of lead that we actually take in on average. So remember, some amount of lead is in many of the things that we already consume and are exposed to daily. So an extensive diet study in the US investigated how much lead people are actually getting from their food. And the researchers estimated about 90% of adults consume around 3.2 to 7.8 micrograms per day. So set against that background, the worst product that Consumer Reports identified is certainly concerning. So it was Naked Nutrition's Mass Gainer Powder. So they found it contained 7.7 micrograms of lead per serving. But again, let's try and put that back into context of the different numbers that we've been looking at. So first, there's the range of typical US daily consumption of lead. So most people, again, that's between 3.2 to 7.8 micrograms per day. So that's 7.7 micrograms in a serving of this protein powder. It is on the high end, but it's still within a typical daily exposure level. And when we have a look at the FDA's conservative threshold, which is 8.8 micrograms per day, that protein powder serving, when combined with our typical daily lead exposure, it may push our lead intake slightly above the FDA's threshold. But remember that the FDA intentionally set that level at one-tenth of the actual concern to give us a margin of safety. So with these metrics in mind, we get a really different picture than Consumer Reports' alarming claim of a dose of 15 times their level of concern. It doesn't actually look like there's much reason for alarm here at all. And there's one more final piece of context to help us make sense of Consumer Reports' analysis. It's about how much lead exposure has changed through time. Researchers found that the typical lead level in the blood of US adults was 0.855 micrograms per deciliter in 2018. But the average level back in the 1970s was 15 micrograms per deciliter. So the levels of lead in the blood have actually fallen dramatically. And we can see the same trend in this chart for blood levels in European countries. So let me draw on all of the points that we've looked at together. The safety threshold used by consumer reports is much stricter than used by the FDA, which is already itself very strict. And the amount of lead in the protein powders that they examined, even in the worst case, is within the range of the average daily exposure in the US, and it's way below the average exposure in Europe. And overall, when we zoom out, our levels of lead in our blood, they've still fallen dramatically over the past few decades. So that means that our level of lead exposure is already low compared to recent history. So all of this adds up to a reason to be aware of lead in protein powders, but it's no reason to panic. And the crucial thing to remember here is that the dose makes the poison. Yes, lead is toxic, and we want to do everything that we can to avoid it, but zero exposure is basically impossible, and it's an unrealistic goal. Lead isn't much of what we already eat. So consider this analysis of fruits and vegetables available in the Polish market. Every product examined contained at least some lead. And there's one more thing to note about Consumer Reports analysis. It's possible that the amounts of lead that they tested in the products, they might not be correct. So for example, they found 6.3 micrograms of lead per serving in Huel's Black Edition protein powder. But in contrast, NSF, which is a world-leading testing and certification company, found that the level of lead was way below their detection limit of 3.6 micrograms. So this at least argues for some caution with interpreting Consumer Reports results. Personally, I use a pea protein powder, and I plan to continue doing so. So I keep an eye on testing reports like this one, but I focus on safety thresholds like the FDAs that are linked to a cautious approach in light of known clinical risks. And if we're concerned, Consumer Reports found that KOS, Organic Superfood Plant Protein Powder, or Plant Fusion Complete Protein, and Orgain Organic Plant Protein Powders to be some plant options that have got much lower levels of lead compared to other versions that they tested. 
ConsumerLab.com is also another great resource for testing recommendations for protein powders. So I want to close with an important reminder. Protein powder is a supplement, so that means that it's meant to complement, not replace, a diet that's rich in whole food sources of protein. So plant-based protein sources like lentils and chickpeas, beans and nuts, they're packed with additional nutrients. And they're also rich in fiber, which has been linked to a whole range of significant health benefits. But if we take a step back, I am still a bit alarmed about the current protein obsession. So if you watch my channel, you'll know that I believe in the importance of protein. But this trend is changing eating patterns in a way that threatens to damage our health. So make sure to check out this next video here to find out why.